Let us now turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. <clears throat> one of the wisdom psalms of David, because Solomon, in one sense, got it from his father, which sets forth all sorts of pithy maxims and gives instruction and calling. We read all of Psalm 37. A psalm of David. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be, but the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword, and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked, for the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume, and to smoke shall they consume away. The wicked borroweth, and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy, and giveth. For such as be blessed of the Lord shall inherit the earth, and they that are cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him, with his hand. I have been young, and now I am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful, and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil, and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord, and keep his way, 
and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them, because they trust in him. Amen. Sometimes the people of God are envious at the wealthy wicked instead of being grateful to Jehovah who is the overflowing fountain of all good. Sometimes our hearts are cold when they should be warm towards the Lord our God. Sometimes our minds are confused by the lies of the world instead of being clear through the truth of Scripture. Sometimes our souls are discouraged instead of being filled with hope. And sometimes we are like this even on the Lord's Day when we're especially called to commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And even when we're in public worship with our fellow saints. Now our text this morning will certainly bring clarity of mind and encouragement of heart by filling us with hope and gratitude by the Holy Spirit and through a true faith. Listen to Psalm 37, verse 22. For such as be blessed of him, that is, blessed of God, for such as be blessed of God, shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. We're going to consider this text under the theme, The blessed shall inherit the earth. First, what will be received. Second, how it will be received. And third, who will receive it. The blessed shall inherit the earth. What will be received, how it will be received, and who will receive it. Our text contains a Hebrew word which has two main meanings. Sometimes it refers to the earth in a cosmological sense, that is, the world. And other times it means the land in a more limited and territorial sense, which is almost always Canaan or the land of Israel. If we take the word, first of all, in its second sense with regard to Canaan or Israel, who is going to inherit this land? Especially in the earlier Old Testament books, the answer is Israel. The nation of Israel will inherit the land of Israel, formerly called Canaan. And then comes the follow-up question, who in Israel will really inherit this promised land? Everybody. Everybody in the same sense, or only believing Israelites, some of whom may even have been ethnically Gentiles who were grafted in. David, you see, in Psalm 37, distinguishes. He distinguishes between God's true spiritual people and the wicked. And this distinction is not merely between the saints in Israel 
and the wicked in the world out there of the other nations. But David, in Psalm 37, distinguishes between the saints in Israel and the wicked who are also national Israelites. Because David understood long before Paul penned those words in Romans 9 that they are not all Israel which are of Israel. There is a fair bit in Psalm 37 which fits with this Hebrew word being rendered land in the sense of that strip of realty in the eastern Mediterranean. Look with me at some verses in Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land of Canaan, and verily thou shalt be fed in the land of Canaan. That makes good sense. Verse 10 says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be, that is, be in the land, yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, the house he used to live in, and the land he used to own, and it shall not be. Verses 18 and 19. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. We'll say more about that later. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, the upright, and in the days of famine, when it comes to the land of Canaan, or at least the environs, they shall be satisfied. Verse 25, David says, I have been young, and now I'm old. Some of us can say that. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Here's David, an old man living in the land of Canaan. He's never witnessed such a thing. The righteous is, are ever merciful and lends, and his seed is blessed, referring to his life in the land of Canaan. Similarly, verse 35, David says, I have seen the wicked in great power, and spreading himself like a green bay tree. For instance, wicked Saul, yet he passed away, and lo, he was not, yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. He was gone from the land of Canaan through death. <coughs> but if you take Psalm 37 to be referring only and exclusively to a few thousand square miles in the Middle East, problems arise. What about godly women in the Old Testament? Because according to Old Testament law, Usually, they did not inherit land. It went to the males, the sons. Though, if a father died without sons, as Zelophehad did, his daughters inherited his land. Numbers 27. Someone could say, though, that the women inherited land in connection with or through their husbands. But even then, of course, though most women married, not all did. Yet the text says, such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. Besides believing women, what about the elect who died in infancy or even died in their minority? They didn't inherit a parcel of land in Israel. So the promise, if it's seen to apply only to that real estate, such as be blessed of him shall inherit the land of Canaan, wouldn't be true there either. You can think of 1 Kings 21 and Naboth with his family. Naboth probably did obtain his land the vineyard especially, by inheritance from his father. 
But then, as you know, Jezebel had him stoned to death under trumped-up charges, so that Ahab, her husband, who had been huffing and whinging, could then seize Naboth's vineyard. But what about Naboth's sons? Because 2 Kings 9, verse 26, indicates that they were murdered too. Because there's no point killing Naboth if his sons are alive, for they'll get the land, and then Naboth still won't get his vineyard. So Jezebel, being thorough, polished them off too. Naboth's sons didn't inherit land in the earthly kingdom. And if you think of Old Testament history yet further, you ask yourself, what about those who lived and died in the Babylonian captivity, some of whom were believers? What did they inherit in the land of Judah? And even if they did get some sort of a title deed when their father passed away, they never even got to see their land, never mind live in it, and never mind live in it in peace. As Psalm 37 speaks of this. And now we should bring in, I alluded to this earlier, the fact that Psalm 37 speaks of believers dwelling in the land forever. Verse 18. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. 29. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Verse 27. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. Verse 28 continues. What do we do with that if we're only speaking and exclusively referring to the land of Canaan, earthly Canaan, in Psalm 37? You could try to say, well, it means forever in the line of their generations. And then I recall the earlier example of Naboth. There was a righteous, godly man. His generations were cut off by Jezebel. Did Jezebel win? Did Jezebel break the promise of God? And besides the Babylonian captivity that I already mentioned, the Jews were carted off from the land by the Assyrians <coughs> and later by the Romans. And if you think about verse 22, when it says, such as be blessed of God shall inherit the earth, if you take it as land, then you have to say that there were wicked men who were cursed of God who also legally inherited land from their fathers. If it's only referring to land that you can put a fence around. And if you look at the second half of our text, they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. Well, even believers in the Old Testament in Israel, they were cut off from the land of Canaan, at least if you mean by cut off, died. And so were taken away from their physical property. Though cut off, typically in the Bible, and especially here, means cut off in God's wrath. We can also cast fuller light upon this scripture from the old from the New Testament revelation. We even have as decisive the words of Jesus Christ himself in the very sermon on the mount and even in the beatitudes interpreting for us the word rendered land or earth in Psalm 37. The third beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit 
the earth. And Jesus is there quoting Psalm 37, verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth. The earth in the cosmological sense, the world. In Matthew 5, verse 5, when it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, certainly doesn't merely mean property that can be sold through an estate agent, but it refers to the highest new heavens and the new earth because the concluding beatitude says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. It's not just Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount in the third beatitude. We have also the inspired words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 4 verse 13. The promise that he should be the heir of the world, the cosmos, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The promise to Abraham, Paul says, without even bothering to prove it or argue for it, as I've been doing in Psalm 37, he takes it for granted. The promise to Abraham was not merely that he would inherit the land of Canaan. The promise was that he should be the heir of the world, the cosmos. And it came through the righteousness of faith as one justified by faith alone. Matthew 5, the words of Jesus. Romans 4, the teaching of the Apostle Paul. And here we have Hebrews 11, verse 16. Speaking of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Point being that if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants had only thought about the land of Canaan, God would have been ashamed of them. Like the way a father would look upon a son, son, I'm embarrassed by you. I'm ashamed. Is that all you thought I was going to give you? For God has prepared for them a city. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob looked for a heavenly country and city, and therefore all their true spiritual children, because Abraham is our father, the father of all believers, looked for the precise same thing. Therefore David did in Psalm 37. Therefore all the Old Testament saints did. And therefore all the true New Testament saints do. This truth regarding the land or earth as to its real, ultimate, highest meaning is proved also by the fact that it is tied up with God's covenant. Whenever it's revealed. Because it's always, ultimately, global, pointing to the new heavens and the new earth. Think of the covenant with pre-fall Adam. Dominion over the earth. And Jesus Christ is the last Adam who brings in the new creation. The covenant with Noah was cosmic. The whole world would never be flooded again. And so the sign is the rainbow in the sky. Abraham was promised Canaan only as a picture of the world, as we saw from Romans 4 and Hebrews 11. Moses was told about a wonderful land which flows with milk and honey. But Hebrews 3 and 4 says that Moses couldn't bring them in, and even Joshua <coughs> couldn't bring them in to the real land with peace and rest. Jesus Christ was needed for that. And even when we think of the covenant with David, the 
covenant that involves now a king in Israel, a righteous king, with a kingdom. That kingdom involves land. We sang Psalm 72, for instance. We all know it's Jesus Christ, David's greater son, who has a throne not merely in Jerusalem, but a throne in heaven, and therefore a kingdom that's universal, who's going to bring in the new heavens and the new earth. And the point of all this is that this is what each and every believer, us beloved, what we will receive in Jesus Christ. Now listen to these verses from Psalm 37 in the light of the full biblical revelation and thinking about yourself. Verse 9. Evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, me too, they shall inherit the earth. Verse 11. The meek shall inherit the earth. For all my sins and weaknesses, as the child of God, I am meek. I do humble myself before God. I am teachable. Though maybe not always that teachable, but basically I am. And I will delight myself in the abundance of peace. Verse 18. The inheritance of the upright, yours, shall be forever. Such as be blessed of him... Verse 22, shall inherit the earth. God keeps saying it over and over again, not to bore you, but to impress you with the truth. Verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. That's your future. Verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee as a king to inherit the land. This is what I mean by the clear, pure truth of Scripture that the child of God believes and understands and appropriates and says, this is right. This is coming to me. And this encourages me and is part of my hope in Jesus Christ our Lord. Earlier we sang from Psalm 16. God is my inheritance. That fundamental, not even the land. God is my inheritance. He's the portion of my cup. The lot that falls out to me, God alone maintains it. And therefore, the lines have fallen out to me in pleasant places. I've got a beautiful inheritance in the land, the new heavens, and the new earth. Thou wilt show me the path of life, says verse 11. There's a full store of joy for me. Before God's face at his right hand are pleasures forevermore through Jesus Christ. And in the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And the believer is called to tremble in the text too because all the wicked every last one of them, including the ones that most annoy and trouble us, they're all going to be cut off. They're going to be cut off in the fiery wrath of God, cut off from this world, cut off most certainly from the new heavens and the new earth, cut off finally and irrevocably without any hope ever. So we're not to fret about them or their supposed success or to envy the reprobate rich. Our text also teaches us how we receive the earth. We all understand that there are various ways in which we receive different things. Sometimes we work for things and we earn wages and in secular, earthly things, this is the right and the good way. But in divine and spiritual things, the only thing that fallen human beings can ever earn with God is punishment and wrath. For the wages of sin 
is death. As opposed to works, often scripture uses the language of gift. We receive things from God only by gift. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the word gift, of course, emphasizes that it's all of God's grace, it's free, it's unmerited. But our text speaks of inheriting the earth. In fact, Psalm 37 refers to our inheriting more than any of the other 149 Psalms. It uses the verb inherit five times. It uses a noun rightly rendered inheritance once. Inherit, 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 inheritance, inherit, inherit. There's a point being driven home in Psalm 37. Why the word inherit? Well, inherit, like the word gift, is also an indicator of grace, free grace. But there's a slightly different perspective with regard to inheritance because it emphasizes the sovereign disposition of the one who bequeaths. When you're dealing with a will, someone has just died, he could theoretically leave his property to anyone. But if you receive something in an inheritance, that person bequeathed it to you. He decided it, his disposition, there it is, there's a piece of paper, and that's that. And Almighty God gives us an inheritance in Jesus Christ that is stupendous. He gives to us the earth, all of it, not just a few fields. Somebody might think in hearing that, well, what am I, what in the white world am I going to do with it? Don't worry about that. It's inherited in Jesus Christ in company with the whole church. He gives us the whole world. This truth about inheriting too carries the idea of a legal right. And this helps us as well because one of the things that arises in our minds when we hear this truth is what right do I have to inherit the earth? None. We have no right at all. We forfeited any claims or rights. But the truth is, the believer should say this without pride, but certainty, we do have every right, all right, in Jesus Christ, because God has given us these rights. He tells us in the scriptures, we have, on the basis of this text and many others, the authority to claim the new heavens and the new earth as ours. To use the language of Romans 8, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Inheriting. It not only carries the idea of God's sovereign disposition, I give it to you, or of legal rights, you have the authority to claim it and possess it. But inheritance also suggests, probably much more strongly than that word suggests, to our family relationship to him. Friends may inherit. Even then, though, we're God's friends of Jesus Christ in the covenant of grace. But I dare say that chiefly it's family who inherits. Children inherit. And we are the sons and daughters of God by adoption. 
That strengthens the idea of our right to it. Spouses inherit. We're in again because we are the bride and wife of Jesus Christ. We could add that inherit is also especially appropriate as a word to be used in Psalm 37 in connection with what we inherit. People may inherit, or you in your will may give it to someone else to inherit money or investments or various possessions. That favorite vase of mine is to go to Aunt Aggie who always admired it. You know the sort of thing. But land, land especially passes on to other people through inheritance. Particularly to one's children. And Hebrews 9 uses the language of Jesus Christ's last will and testament, as it were. Verse 15 of that chapter tells us that he has made out to us an eternal inheritance, including the new heavens and the new earth. And now, the will of Jesus Christ is in force through his death. Because as that chapter makes clear, and as we all know, that while the testator lives, the will is not in force. But with the death of the testator, it comes into effect. Use this to strengthen your faith and hope that the new world is yours and will be yours, as Psalm 37 says, forever. Argue with yourself and your own doubt that this must be the case unless you want to challenge the will. As far as I'm aware, probably the best way of challenging the will is to claim that the testator was not of sound mind. You're going to have a hard case proving that against our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was not of sound mind. Anyone who would try that would themselves certainly be not of a sound mind that's what doubt is insanity and madness regarding the will and so every christian ought to be absolutely certain that this has been willed to you irrevocably by a bequeath of the son of god himself in his own precious last will and testament his last word on the subject it's yours and you could even say figuratively speaking he penned his will as it were in his own blood because hebrews 9 then goes on to speak of the atoning blood of the sacrificial death of jesus christ as purchasing all the good things of salvation for us the forgiveness of sins access to God and that eternal inheritance including the new world of perfect sinless righteousness and if you were to say with a little bit of Arminianism stealing up in your heart though ideologically and doctrinally you don't believe in it but if you were to say as a true believer you know maybe after all I might fall away and I might not receive this inheritance. Well, Psalm 37 teaches the perseverance of the saints, every last one of them. Verse 23, immediately after our text, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, head five of the canon speaks of that, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down why? For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And verse 28 makes the preservation of the saints really clear. The Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints 
They are preserved forever. So we need to be assured of that. And maybe you, as a child of God, believe that you have been treated unfairly in a will. There are many people out there, some of them believers, who have had that happen to them. You don't think it was right that you received so little. Or perhaps you're troubled because you received nothing at all. And maybe the person even said to you, there was stuff for you and you feel cheated. He lied to me. Perhaps this came about because no will was made. And then it just falls through a legal machinery. Perhaps the will was made a long time ago, reflecting the attitude of the person maybe 30, 40 years ago. But his attitude changed, but he never actually changed his will. And you're frozen out. Maybe you wonder to yourself if some pressure was put on the testator by a person who did inherit mightily in that will. Well then, we need to remember that God is sovereign and he's sovereign over unfavorable and maybe even unjust wills as well. And the earthly riches that the ungodly may receive in such a will, maybe they receive it unfairly, ultimately, it will do them no good because they that are cursed of God shall be cut off. And then, recall to your heart this text, I may have lost out there, but I have a far greater inheritance, an eternal inheritance, such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. I'm not going to worry that he didn't get his car or I lost out in a few thousand or I didn't get the house or a share of the house or the land. I have an, an eternal inheritance of the whole earth. I'm going to encourage myself in that. I'm going to hope. And I'm going to get over it. This 37th Psalm describes too, in several places and in different words, precisely those who will inherit the earth. They're called, in verses 9 and 34, those who wait upon the Lord, those who believe and who are patient. Even when things don't look like you're going to inherit the earth, which is 99.9% .9 of our time on earth. Verse 11, Jesus quoted this, as I said earlier, the meek shall inherit the earth. Those who humble themselves before God, those who are taught by the scriptures, they inherit the earth. And the believer says again, that's me, that's me. Verses 18 and 29 say the upright or the righteous, those who are in conformity to God's standard, the law, truly, though far from perfectly, <coughs> And that through God's transforming grace and according to our holy desires that arise from the new man. Verse 34 says, those who keep God's way will inherit the earth. Those who obey, though who always need the forgiveness of sin, we will inherit. And our text uses the lovely phrase, such as be blessed of God shall inherit the earth. Those who are blessed in Jesus Christ alone, those who are blessed before the very foundations of the earth in eternal election, those who are blessed at the cross when Jesus Christ bore the curse of God against us for our sins, those who are blessed now through faith in him, those who are blessed forever will, as another blessing, inherit the earth. Because God's purpose is a blessed people in a blessed world 
under the reign of the blessed Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. And Jesus even spoke of this in that famous parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. This is what the king himself says to us on the judgment day. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. David said, For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. To the others on that day, the king will say, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And our text says, They that be cursed of him shall be cut off. In short, there are only two types of people, as our text in this whole chapter teaches. You're either blessed of God or you're cursed of God. Now, on the last day, and forever, one or the other. And if you're blessed, you can't be cursed. And if you're cursed, you can't be blessed. Because nobody is blessed and cursed, and nobody is cursed and blessed. Such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. And if a man or a woman is cut off and damned, they're not blessed in the future, they're not blessed now, they're not blessed ever. Because there's no universal grace or common grace or impotent grace or confusing grace, because that's all it is, because God makes two categories and they muddy the water in the middle. One last thought based on one little word at the start of the text. It begins does our verse with the word for. The point is that the comfort and hope of the eternal blessedness that we will receive helps us even in little things. Verse 21 says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. And it's just like them too. But the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. That is, the believer who rests in this truth knows his vast riches in Jesus Christ, his miserable, stingy heart softens at least to this extent that he shows some mercy and he is enabled by the grace of God even to give. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, bless to us thy word. Help our unbelief, strengthen our faith, and deepen our hope that we may think upon these things and encourage ourselves in the Lord. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>